ಶಭಾನುಸುಮಿ ಹರಿ ಪ್ರಿಯ ವಂಶಕಲ್ಪತರೋಭ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧೂಭ್ಯ ಪತೀತೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಭೂನಿತ್ಯನಂದ ಶ್ರೀಅದ್ವೈತಾಧರ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸದಿ ಗೌರಾಭಕ್ತವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಶಿಲ್ಪಾದಿ Hare Krishna so good morning to everyone and uh, thank you so much for coming and again thank you for this opportunity so we are coming to the final session of our journey to Vrindavan via Kurukshetra and so far on this journey we've learned different things we've seen Kurukshetra as a battlefield and we reflected on how that battlefield is within us sometimes we wake up in the morning and life does seem like a battle it does seem like a fight it does seem like every day new enemies are cropping up and new obstacles are appearing and so we learned that if we want to go to vrindavan we have to understand how to navigate the battlefield of life we have to become spiritual warriors, warriors yes and um so in the first session we were talking about fighting yes we must fight with the material energy because we have declared declared war on maya but then in the second day we went further and we said it's not just about fighting but it's now about regulating while we're in this world now we have to regulate ourselves into a higher lifestyle and therefore jagannath puri is also representing the dharma kshetra or the place of dharma dharma literally means the best way or the right way to live and so we were talking about dharma and the importance of living in dharma because even though dharma may not be the goal or the apara dharmas of this world may not be the goal they do act as a stepping stone because they allow us to develop some purity of heart some purification some sensitivity some uh, opportunity for service uh, dharma is offering many many gifts to us on the journey so we talked in the second session very much about regulating but now the question remains by fighting the material world the material energy and by regulating your life into a higher grade of existence will it be enough will it be enough to get to vrindavan uh, by those endeavors what do you think no. No. so if fighting is necessary and then later on regulating is necessary what do you think is the added ingredient required to make it to vrindavan what is required to make up the rest of the distance to enter into the playground of god mercy mercy surrender. other ideas surrender devotion feeling ruchi desire eagerness tatra lolyam api mulyam ekalam the one price is eagerness greed yes these are all good answers because my i have a mathematical brain and my mind works in structures and things which are easy to remember and formulas which has its limitations also in spiritual life admittedly today i will offer you that we need to be fighting we need to be regulating 
But the final lesson of Kurukshetra, the final dimension which will help us to enter into the spiritual realm, is that beyond fighting and regulating, uh, we need to be crying. We need to be crying because if you think about all the answers you gave, uh, they are reflected in this crying to learn the art of how to cry for Krishna. Uh, recently, <laughs> I, I'm very tall, uh, as, you, as you may have noticed. <laughs> Over COVID, I was doing many, many Zoom calls and so I was connecting with many people I never connected with and then when I finally met them, they said, wow, you're so tall. We never noticed on Zoom. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you may not notice on Zoom. So I'm very tall and nowadays I'm doing a lot of traveling. So a few months ago, I was taking a flight to Cairo and uh, when you're as tall as me, one thing you need to do when you check in for the flight is you need to get the emergency seat right <laughs> there's someone uh, empathizes with me thank you yeah so the first thing I do when I get to the airport is I always try to get the emergency seat so usually my my record has been good recently I've got like nine out of ten flights I get without paying I get the emergency seat that you know they take mercy upon me so I got onto this Egypt air flight um, and I sat into the emergency seat and it was a quite a long flight so I was thinking okay Let's see, because it always depends who's around you, you know. Um, so I sat down and the, cr uh, the plane filled up. I was in the emergency seat, so much leg room. It was wonderful. Um, and there was no one around me. I thought, wow, this is, this is my bhajan kutir for the next uh, eight hours. And then just as the plane seemed to be closing its doors and the last few passengers came in, um, some passengers came to sit next to me. And you may know that um, every perk in this world comes with a cost <laughs> and the perk of the leg room uh, that you get from the emergency seat comes with a cost do you know what the cost is you know what the danger is of being in an emergency seat <laughs> yes babies <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, you may notice that in the emergency seat, that's where they have the place for the cot. So it's usually newborn babies, very young babies. And somehow or other, the younger they are, the louder they cry. <laughs> and so there I was on this flight. I thought it was going to be the bhajan kutir with lots of leg room. And it ended up a kind of crowded place uh, with a crying baby. So I sat down. And the baby was on full form, <laughs> crying, crying, crying. So I thought, how, how will I focus? Bhajan, I need to do bhajan. And then I remembered Srila Prabhupada said, we should cry for Krishna like a baby cries for the mother. And so then I'd use this technique, you can try it out. Every time the baby screeched, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. <laughs> so I tried to internalize the cry of the baby into my meditation and I tell you it was incredibly powerful. <laughs> it was actually really, really good. I felt really, really nice actually. And so I chanted some good rounds surprisingly on that flight. But I was reflecting that actually Everyone in this world is going to cry. Everyone in this world cries. Did you know that? So if you find yourself crying sometimes, don't worry. Everyone will cry. The only question is, what will you cry for? There is the cry of the samsarika, the cry of the conditioned soul trying to find happiness in this material world. And that conditioned soul will cry because everything will frustrate them ultimately, isn't it? We cry after relationships, we cry after failed achievements, we cry after so many different things that don't work out in this world for us. You know what Madhvacharya says? He says, if you would add up all of the tears that the conditioned soul has shed in this world over lifetimes, it would be enough to fill an ocean. 
the cry of the samsarika, the cry of the conditioned soul who is uh, stuck in this material world. And then there is the cry of the sahajya, prakrita sahajya. We have to add that footnote. Hari Parshad Prabhu reminded us. Uh, the cry of uh, the, f the fa fake tears, the superficial tears of someone trying to uh, pretend or uh, put on a facade of a connection with the Supreme Lord when actually they don't have that level of connection. Ultimately, that's a cry of attention, wanting to have attention, wanting to have acknowledgement, wanting to have appreciation. Then there is the cry of the sadhaka, the cry of the sincere spiritual practitioner who says, now Krishna, I had enough in this world. Now Krishna, I don't want to carry on here uh, trying to find substance in the shadow. Now Krishna, I learnt my lessons that I turned away from you. Krishna bahir mukha hoya bhoga vancha kare. I turned away from you and I tried. But now I know it doesn't work. I want to surrender to you Krishna. The cry of the sadhaka. And then there is the cry of the siddha. The cry of those in the spiritual world who are in a relationship of intoxication. Uh, they are also crying, there are also tears in the spiritual world, tears of love, uh, tears which carry different emotions. So can you see now how everyone will cry? But it depends. The cry of the samsarika is a cry out of frustration. The cry of the sahajya is a cry for attention. The cry of the sadhaka is a cry because they want, uh, they have desperation to get back. And the cry of the Siddha is a cry of intoxication, it's a cry of love, uh, Brahma Ashu, uh, the tears of love. And so now we're entering into Kurukshetra and we're thinking about uh, how we will develop that desperation. Therefore, now we want to enter Kurukshetra, understanding <laughs> Kurukshetra as not just the Yuddha Shetra or Dharma Shetra, but Kurukshetra also teaches us about Viraha, separation. Kurukshetra is an incredible, incredible, uh, deeply profound place of spiritual emotion. When we think of crying for Krishna, then we have to try to think uh, who is crying for Krishna? Who are those devotees that cry for Krishna? The ones that cry for Krishna get the mercy of Krishna. The ones that cry for Krishna, uh, Krishna gives his very self to them. Sanatana Goswami writes in the Brihat Bhagavatamrita that Narad Muni was trying to find out who got the most mercy from Krishna. Narad Muni, who has so much mercy from Krishna, there's a beautiful verse in the beginning of the Bhagavatamrita which says, I think it's Narad Muni himself speaking, where he says, No one should feel that they got enough mercy from Krishna. One should always feel, I want more mercy, I want more mercy. When Srila Prabhupada was by a lake and he was feeding, uh, feeding the ducks, I think, yeah, the ducks, and Prabhupada was giving more to one duck, one particular duck was getting the mercy. And then one devotee asked Prabhupada, why are you giving more to that duck? And Prabhupada said, because that duck is quacking the loudest. <laughs> the duck which quacks the loudest gets the most mercy. So who is crying? Who is crying the loudest for Krishna? They get the mercy. So Narad Muni wanted to find out. So Narad Muni first he went to Prayag. He went to Prayag where so many holy people gather, isn't it? Magh Mela, Kumbh Mela, all the yogis, all the ascetics, all the different spiritualists come together in that month. Um, and Narad Muni was looking, he was thinking, all the greatest spiritualists appear in this assembly. Surely I will find out who got the most mercy from Krishna. And there in Prayag, he learned the lesson. Nasadhyati mam yogo na sankhya dharma uddhava nasvadhyaya stapastyago yatha bhaktir mamorajita 
There are so many people in that mela, so many yogis, some of them do mystic yoga, some of them know Sankhya, some of them follow Dharma, some of them are incredible tyagis, incredible levels of austerity and renunciation, but none of that conquers Krishna as much as Krishna is conquered yatha bhaktir mumurjita by love, by devotion. And therefore as Narad Muni was searching, he saw a Brahman, a Prayag, the Prayag Brahman. And he brought out his Shaligram Shila with such devotion, with such attention, with such um, sensitivity of heart. And he began worshipping his Shaligram Shila. He uh, offered many beautiful items and then he served all the devotees, Mahaprasad. And Narad Muni was looking at him and said, yes, definitely, I think you received the most mercy from Krishna. You're such a sincere devotee. Clearly, you are very, very close. And the Prayag Brahman said, no, no, I am very small. You have come to a festival. Everyone is devotional in a festival. Everyone is fired up in a retreat. But then what about outside of that? Uh, yeah, I do this in a festival, I feed the brahmanas, I do this. Uh, and you know, my devotion, my offerings are very, very small. Uh, in his humility, he said, there is someone who's greater than me. And that person doesn't just do this festival on one day. For that person, every day is a festival. And for that person, they don't just offer some small offerings like me, their offerings are grand. And if you want to find out who got more, more mercy, it's not me. Go to the south because there's a king there, the southern king. And in his kingdom, he is worshipping the Lord with incredible devotion. So Narad Muni ventured there to find out. Maybe he's the one that got the most mercy. And he arrived there and he saw a festival, so many people. And the king was leading all the subjects in worshipping the Lord. And he came to the king and he said, yes, yes, clearly you got the most mercy. I heard it. I heard it from the Prayag Brahman. The Vaishnavas never lie. And he said, yes, I got some mercy, but yeah, I'm very small, you know. Yes, I'm worshipping in this kingdom, but there is someone who has a much greater domain of rule than me. And someone who's using all of that for Krishna, offering it. Someone in whom, uh, whose abode the Lord is also residing and someone who is not just doing this for a short time like me <clears throat> but someone who worships like this for one entire Manu, 71 Divya Yugas. Who is that? There you have to go if you want to find out who got more mercy. So where did he go? Then he went to Indra Loka. Indra, yes, Indra is in charge of the heavens. Indra is there for one whole Manu. Indra has incredible opulence. And there Indra is worshipping um, <coughs> Upendra. There Indra is having so much uh, facility, so much devotion is there. So Narad Muni went there, he began glorifying Indra. He said, clearly you got the most mercy from Krishna. Indra said, no, no, not me, not me. Narada Muni was thinking, oh my God, like everywhere I go, they say no. Indra said, no, no, it wasn't me. I made a big mistake, don't you know? You think I got so much mercy? I made so many mistakes in my life. One day I disrespected my spiritual master, Brihaspati. Later on, in order, uh, in order of the sequence of events, I did something even worse. Uh, I harmed Vishvarup. Uh, <clears throat> Brahman, later on I asked for the bones of Dadichi uh, in order to defeat uh, the demons. See how many mistakes I made. Indra said, don't you know what I did in Vrindavan? I sent the Samvarta cloud to inundate Vrindavan with rains. I tried to harm the Brajabhasis. Can't you see? I made so many mistakes. I get intoxicated by pride sometimes. Clearly I got some mercy, but there's someone who got more mercy than me. Because I have this domain of the heavenly planets, but this person is in charge of the entire creation. I rule for one Manvantar, but this person's lifespan is much greater than mine. 
and this person was directly instructed by Krishna clearly they got more mercy who's that? Brahma so then he rose and he went to Brahma Loka and there was Brahma and then he began glorifying Brahma and Brahma said no no how can you who sent you here who told you I'm the greatest devotee he said Indra sent us he said you're the greatest devotee Indra said he made a mistake Brahma said Indra made a mistake I made an even worse mistake at least in Indra's mistake through his mistake all the Brajabhasis were brought together for seven days something that had never happened before but my mistake was even more grave my mistake was so bad that it created a distance, a separation between Krishna and his most dear devotees. That was a grave mistake. So no, no, it's not me. I did not receive the most mercy. But I can tell you who received the most mercy. And I'm not just going to tell you what I think. I'm going to tell you what the Shastras say. Because the Shastra says, Nimnaganam yatha Ganga, Devanam Achyuto yatha, Vaishnavanam yatha Sambhu, Purananam Midam Tatha. Of all waters, Ganga is foremost. Of all the gods, Achyuta is foremost. Of uh, all the scriptures, the Puranas are foremost. And of all the Vaishnavas, who is foremost? Shambhu, Vaishnavanam, Yatha Sambhu. So he said, Go to Shiva. I am quoting you Shastra. Dasmat Shastra Brahmanam Te. Uh, this is the uh, evidence. So he went to Shiva Loka. And there he saw Shiva and then he started glorifying Shiva. You got the most mercy. You got the most mercy. And Shiva said, No, no, me? Don't you know? I came to this world and I started the Sampradaya of Mayavad. Mayavadam asachastram prachanam bodhamuchyate uh, How can you say I got the I deviated people Don't you see me? I'm in the mode of ignorance I'm always surrounded by ghosts, hobgoblins and so many um, I did not get the most mercy But I can tell you who did No, no, but you were Shastra says Vaishnavanam yathasavu No, no, no I tell you another Shastric quote There is someone who is known as the Bhakta Shiromani, the crest jewel of all devotees. And that devotee was constantly absorbed in thought of Krishna. In the most acute situations, Krishna never left that person's mind. Who is that? Prahlad. Prahlad. Prahlada Dadangri Bhajane. Yes, Prahlad was the embodiment of remembrance of Krishna. So you go to Prahlad, see Prahlad. So he came to Prahlad. Prahlad said, me? I'm not the highest devotee. Uh, yes, uh, the Lord came to protect me. Um, but actually the Lord didn't come to protect me. The Lord actually came to annihilate Hiranyakashipu to fulfill other boons, to keep the words of uh, other great personalities. It wasn't so much for me. And Prahlad said, who am I? I just remember the Lord. But what is remembrance? A deeper relationship is active. So I just remembered the Lord, but there was someone who was always active, someone who was always serving, someone who was always thinking how to extend themselves for the service of their beloved. That person is the embodiment of Dasyam. And therefore, if you want to know who got the most mercy, you have to go there. Who's that? Hanuman, yes. Hanuman is the embodiment of service. We went to see Hanuman. Hanuman said, me? I, I got the most mercy? No, no, I think you're mistaken. I think there's someone else who got more mercy than me. Because, yes, I served the Lord. Um, <clears throat> but the Lord uh, was served was also serving his devotees. There, was, there were some devotees who were being served by the Lord. And who were those devotees? The Lord became their messenger. The Lord became their charioteer. The Lord became their assistant, their counsel, their support. The Lord was always there for them. I may have served the Lord, but these devotees are greater because the Lord was serving them. And who are they? the Pandavas so he went to see the Pandavas 
The Pandavas, you got the most mercy. The Pandavas said, no, no, we didn't get the most mercy. <laughs> because the Lord comes here for a purpose. Why does the Lord come? Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyutanam dharmasya tadatmanam srijamiyam The Lord comes to remove a dharma. And therefore when the Lord comes to remove a dharma, He has to do it with the cooperation of the Raja Rishis, the kings. And therefore, yes, the Lord served us, but it was more like a transactional relationship because He wanted, you know, he, we were together doing something. Um, we are not in the inner circle. There are some individuals who are in the inner circle uh, who have a closer relationship with Krishna. They are Krishna's own family. If you want to know who got more mercy, then you have to go to the the Yadavas, yes, the Yadavas, they got more mercy, they're Krishna's own family. Who can be closer than Krishna's own family? And when they went to the Yadavas, then the Yadavas said, yes, yes, we got mercy, but there was one amongst us who got the most mercy. He was so close to Krishna, he looked exactly like Krishna. Uh, he was taught by Brihaspati everything. He was so confidential that when the Lord had important missions, then he sent that individual to different places. Uh, that individual got the most mercy. Who is that? Uddhava. Uddhava. So he went to Uddhava. Uddhava, you got the most mercy. Don't deny. Accept. <laughs> Uddhava said, I thought I got the mercy. But then Krishna sent me. Krishna sent me to Vrindavan. And in Vrindavan I realized... I didn't get the most mercy. There are more confidential devotees than me. Devotees who have a level of dedication, a level of uh, complete surrender, a level of complete naturality and intensity of devotion that I cannot compare to anything or anyone else. And therefore I had to pray. Asamaho chadanare nujasam maham syam Vrindavane kimapi gulmalatau sadhinam I just want to become a creeper in Vrindavan, in some bush in Vrindavan, off the main path so that when the gopis are intoxicated looking for Krishna and they come off the main path and they're wondering, completely unaware of who they are, where they are, looking for their beloved, then maybe they'll step on me. And maybe I'll get the dust from their lotus feet. And therefore I realized the ones who got the most devo uh, mercy were the ones who gave themselves entirely the gopis of Vrindavan. And in this way, Sanatan Goswami, through the journey of Narad Muni, takes us to the Bhagavatamrita, the essence, the nectar, the um, apex of the Bhagavatam, which is to understand that the gopis and their love for Krishna was something which was unparalleled. We often hear that the ten, the cantos of the Bhagavatam are Krishna's body, and then we hear that the tenth canto is Krishna's smiling face. And in the tenth canto, we often hear that they are very, very special chapters. The twenty-first chapter of the Bhagavatam is the Venu Geet, uh, the song of Krishna's flute. The separation that the gopis felt when they heard uh, that sound coming from Krishna's flute. Shri Manara Sarasadam Bhi Vamshi Vatatata Stita Garshan Venusvaner Gopi Gopinatha Shri Estunaha. The flute was the trigger, the Rasa Rambhi. It was the sound which signified the beginning of the Rasa dance. Just like when there's a football game, then the whistle is the. That's okay. The whistle is the beginning of the match, or just like when there's an Olympics race, then the gun is the beginning of the race. So when Krishna plays his flute, then that's the beginning, Rasa Rambhi, the beginning of the Rasa dance, the inauguration. And so the 21st chapter of the 10th canto is the Venu Geet. The 31st chapter of the 10th canto is the Gopi Geet. Isn't it? Tavakatham ritam tapta jivanam kaviviriditam kalmashapaham. All these beautiful verses where the gopis, in separation from Krishna, on the banks of the Yamuna, are singing 
um, wondering when they will come again in contact with their beloved. Thirty-fifth chapter of the tenth canto is the Yuga Lagit, when Krishna goes out during the day with his cowherd boys to herd the cows. Then the gopis are feeling separation. When will he come back? When will he see him again? And therefore, that is a very also a very, very special chapter. 39th chapter of the 10th canto is the Viraha Geet. Why? Because that's the chapter in which Akrura comes. Akrura, the one who's not cruel, but the one who's the most cruel, because he takes Krishna and Balaram away. And therefore the gopis, Govinda Dhamo Dharamadavedi, they are crying that Krishna is leaving us. Will Krishna ever come back? Therefore Viraha Geet. And the 47th chapter of the 10th canto, Brahmara Geet. Because now in separation, Uddhava comes to Vrindavan and then we hear the song of the bee and the sentiments of the gopis. So if the 10th canto is Krishna's body and the 10th canto is Krishna's face, sometimes it's also mentioned by commentators that the 10th canto is also considered Krishna's heart. And if the 10th canto is Krishna's heart, then these five chapters, 21, 31, 35, 39, 47, are considered the five life heirs of Krishna. In other words, this is the heart of the heart. The love of the gopis and the separation and the intensity that they have for Krishna. So first when we think of uh, the intensity of separation we have to understand that this is manifested in the gopis. So then we have to ask ourselves what does this all have to do with Kurukshetra? Because surely if the most elevated love is the love of the gopis in separation that's in Vrindavan so what does this all have to do with uh, Kurukshetra? Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur <coughs> often made some statements which were shocking he used to make shocking statements uh, once he made the statement that uh, most people are interested in Radharani because of her connection with Krishna but we are only interested in Krishna because of his connection with Radharani as <laughs> Hari Parshad Prabhu was explaining yesterday Vaishnavas are worshippers of Vishnu Karshanas are worshippers of Krishna but Gaudiyas are worshippers of Srimati Radharani and so this was like many people could not understand this it was a shocking statement Another shocking statement Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur once made, he said, Hiranya Kashipu proclaimed Nishingadev's glories even more than Prahlad. <laughs> really? He tried to kill him. How's that? How is it possible? Is it true? Yes, because what is the speciality of Nishingadev? What's the glory? What's the real glory of Nishingadev? What's the real glory of Nishingadev? What is, why is Nishingadev? For example, uh, Rupa Goswami says, for us three deities are uh, primary, Ram, Nishinga and Krishna. Why? Because in these forms of the Lord, we are seeing Bhakta Vatsalya the intimate connection, the intimate love between the Lord and His devotee. So Hiranya Kashipu proclaimed the glory of the Lord more than Prahlad? Yes, because it was Hiranya Kashipu's animosity, it was Hiranya Kashipu's aggression, it was Hiranya Kashipu's uh, um, attack that then brought out the love of Nishingadev for His devotee. So then, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Sounded a little shocking, but now it kind of makes sense. Who proclaimed the glories of Lord Ram? Hanuman, of course, but maybe who more than Hanuman? Ravan. Because as soon as Ravan came on the scene, the intensity of the relationship between the Lord and his devotees increased. Yes, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had many, many beautiful associates, but who proclaimed the glory greater than all of them? 
Jagai and Madai. Because when uh, Madai attacked uh, Nityananda, then the Lord exhibited something very different because of his love. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur had made all these statements, very uh, controversial, shocking statements. And one other statement he made, which was very, very shocking, is this statement. Kurukshetra is the best place for bhajan. Only bogus, hollow people favor Vrindavan. Is that shocking? If you want to go to Vrindavan, you're bogus and hollow, is it? <laughs> what does this mean? This was not his own creation. He was echoing the sentiments of his predecessor because what did Bhaktivinoda Thakur say? This is what Bhaktivinoda Thakur said. I would like to spend the last days of my life in Kurukshetra. I shall construct a cottage near Brahmakund and pass the rest of my days there. Kurukshetra is the real place of bhajan. Now I at this point will admit that I am very limited. I'm a small jiva with no devotion. And I will say a few things and then later on I will ask for help from my uh, superiors and seniors Sachin Anand Maharaj and Hari Parashat Prabhu to actually give you the real purport of these statements but these statements are very very deep Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj who was Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's illustrious disciple he said when I heard Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur say this it was like falling from a tree falling from the tree house. He said, I couldn't understand it. I always thought myself, someone very intent, I listened always very carefully, understood everything. He said, I did not understand. What did he mean by this? What does it mean that Kurukshetra is the best place for bhajan? Later on, he was unpacking the meaning for the Vaishnav community. Because we understand that many things happened at Kurukshetra, but one very, very special thing that happened Kurukshetra before even the battle of Kurukshetra took place is that there was a solar eclipse. And under occasion of solar eclipses, then all the cultured people would go to a holy place and perform a sacrifice. So on the occasion of the solar eclipse, <coughs> all the Yadavas decided that they would go to Kurukshetra to perform a sacrifice and to meet all the sages in that place. And not only the Yadavas, many, many other uh, communities from all over Bharat came to Kurukshetra. And amongst them also the Brajabasis also came to Kurukshetra. And so there the Brajabasis who had been in separation from Krishna for a long, long time they who are waiting, who are living only by the rope of hope that one day Krishna will come back. They came to Kurukshetra and there in Kurukshetra they had a reunion with Krishna. Here was Krishna with his large retinue, with all the chariots, with all the grandeur of coming from Dwaraka, with so much opulence around him. Krishna who was in a completely different bhav. And there the Rajabhasis came and there in a secluded place uh, Krishna met with the gopis and Krishna began to give them knowledge, give them teachings, give them uh, insights. Krishna began to explain that yes, uh, I'm, I've always been remembering you but life is like this sometimes that straws are together in the river for some time and then downstream all of those straws separate again and so life is like that sometimes we are together sometimes we are separated but on a deeper level we are always together the gopis were hearing this thinking we've heard this before we heard this when you sent Uddhav to give us this message 
we heard all of these teachings you gave at the start of the rasa dance when you were teaching us dharma we heard all of these things before but it did not satisfy our heart krishna we are here with you this is agonizing this is even more agonizing because here we are in kurukshetra in english they have a saying so close and yet so far we're so close to you we're right here again after all of this time in one sense we're so close to you and yet we're so far away because here krishna with you in this mood surrounded by this atmosphere in this setting we cannot actually have the kind of exchange we want to have with you therefore krishna we want to take you back we want to take you to vrindavan we want to take you back to that rural setting that very beautiful setting in the cowherd pastures where we can engage in our natural loving intense relationship with you Bhakti Rakshak Sri Ramaraj then said, Then I begin to understand why Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and Bhakti Vinod Thakur said this that Kurukshetra is the best place for bhajan. Still, it requires some explanation. They explained that the reason is, is because service gains its most. Uh, Service can have its greatest effect when the intensity and necessity of that service is at its greatest. And so they said, because here in Kurukshetra, Radharani's separation reaches its apex, its height, then we will stay in Kurukshetra and we will serve Srimati Radharani who has this desperation, who has this uh, loving, this crying for Krishna and by service to Srimati Radharani in Kurukshetra when her separation is at the highest we will uh, attain the goal of our life and for this reason Kurukshetra uh, is known as the place of separation when glorifying Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur his disciples uh, composed something called Asto Dadasata Shri, the 108 opulences of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And I think the 35th one was this one. They glorified him as a follower of Sri Gauranga. He is the revealer of Kurukshetra, Purushottam, and Alalnath as places of pastimes comprised of searching for Krishna. So as we uh, remember Kurukshetra, we're remembering these pastimes, we're remembering this mood, we're remembering this desperation and we're realizing that we have to develop some of this desperation, we have to develop some of this crying, we have to develop um, this heart. <coughs> uh, Hariparashad Prabhu was explaining that there are different types of separation does anyone remember which are the different types of separation that he was mentioning? Purvarag, Purvarag yes. Man. Man. Man, yes. I think you only covered two. Yeah. Yes. Now there will be further. Now there will be further. For more will be coming. But yes, Purvarag, this is one type of separation that is mentioned by the Goswamis. <laughs> This is the separation that one feels in anticipation of meeting, before meeting. Then there is man. What does man mean? What's the word that Hari Parashat Prabhu gave us? Sulkiness, yes. Transcendental pride. Uh, this is another type of separation that this transcendental pride is also creating a type of transcendental distance and separation. Then the uh, third type of separation which we'll hear more about is Prema Vaichitya. This is a very, very special type of separation in which the two lovers are together but, that, but the thought of separation, the prospect of future separation creates a separation in that very moment. And then there is Pravas, another type of separation. Uh, which is separation by physical distance. So these are the different varieties of separation. 
And now we may ask ourselves, how will we develop this separation? How do we begin to walk this path? If this is what we have to do, if we have to develop this crying, how we will be able to do it? So what does it mean separation for the sadhaka? Is there separation for a sadhaka? Or is the separation only for the siddha? So Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur uh, gives us the key understanding and this is what he writes. It is essential for the sadhaka jivas to cultivate only the mood of vipralamba and because they have never experienced meeting with Krishna their vipralamba will come only in the category of purvarag. So he's making the point here that of the four types of separation those who are sadhakas, they can only uh, achieve the separation of Purva Rag because they have not met Krishna, they have not come in contact with Krishna, they are not having those exchanges live at the moment. So therefore, their Vipralamba has to come in the category of Purva Rag, an anticipation of meeting Krishna. But then the question comes, if one doesn't remember meeting Krishna in the first place, then how will that anticipation to meet Krishna come? If Purva Rag means the anticipation that yes, I will meet Krishna again because I remember being with Krishna before and it was wonderful, but now I will meet Krishna again and that separation, Purva Rag, how will we develop it if we don't remember being with Krishna? So he addresses this point and he goes on to say, but without having ever met Krishna, how can they experience separation in Purvarag from him? And then he gives the answer. By hearing the Leela Katha of Sri Krishna from others. Purvarag is awakened. And therefore this is what we are doing. This is why His Holiness Sachinanda Maharaj, His Grace Hari Parashat Prabhu are giving us the greatest gift. Because from them we are he hearing the Leela Katha of Sri Krishna. And this is uh, giving us the opportunity, if we have the open heart, if we're not like the well, the well, the very shallow well, but if we can open our hearts to be more like an ocean, then as this moon of uh, Leela Katha rises from the uh, mouths of wonderful Vaishnavas, then the separation will begin to manifest. And so Bhaktivinoda Thakur goes on and says, this was the case, with the Dvijapatnis as well as the ladies of Mathura before Krishna's arrival there. Rukmini also had never seen Krishna, but by hearing about him from Sri Narad, Purvarag arose within her heart. Thus she became exceedingly anxious to meet with Krishna. And then he concludes, similarly, by hearing from the Guru and Vaishnavas, or by reading the Shastras, the Jivas may have Purvarag Vipralamba awakened within their hearts. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur Ki. So, these are some of the points um, that I wanted to share with you. Um, <coughs> I will ask if they feel uh, comfortable and with their permission His Holiness Sachinanda Maharaj, His Grace Hari Parashat Prabhu to perhaps take us further and give us some insights into how we can cry for Krishna but before I do that um, I wanted to read some poetry uh, by Sachinanda Maharaj Can I do that Maharaj with your permission? Because I think Sachinandan Maharaj has uh, beautifully encapsulated our topic. Uh, if you, everything I may have said is very shallow, um, but I think in Maharaj's poem he has uh, beautifully captured um, <coughs> what it means to cry for Krishna. So you can see here, maybe if you see, it will uh, also go deeper. This is a w beautiful poem written by. Uh, Maharaj uh, entitled The Road of Tears. Shall I read it, Maharaj, or would you like to read it? I should read it. 
the road of tears. So this is very, very beautiful. I feel Maharaj just captures uh, the spirit here so nicely. <clears throat> this is a conversation between a disciple and his guru. The disappointed disciple with a heavy heart speaks. Who can say I've never tried? All those mantras I've chanted, all those vows that kept me awake for so many lonely nights, all those pilgrimages, sacrifices, holy baths in ice-cold water, what to speak of persistently ignoring the requests of my mind and senses to do what is most dear to them. The result, nothing. All this has brought me <clears throat> to at present is desperation. The old emptiness in the heart has only become greater. See if you can identify with this. <laughs> The Guru replies, It seems you have done your best to come before the divine couple. But have you ever tried to act in such a way that they can come before you? Have you yet built your road for them, <clears throat> the road of tears? The road of tears? What tears? Tears of the soul. There are different kinds of tears. Body tears, we cry in physical pain. Mind tears, we cry when emotionally hurt. And sweet tears that come from the soul. As it awakens to its only real need. The soul's need is to enter into the one relationship. And this road of tears can't be found on any map. It begins from your own heart, but it is so attractive to the divine couple that they cannot even imagine ignoring it. Just to begin building this road makes them feel they must come before you. Does this road need many tears? I have cried all my tears for other things. I am completely empty inside. How can I possibly build this road? The Guru enthusiastically, Don't worry, there are oceans of tears arrested in your heart. You only need to learn to direct them to the right cause. Then they become released. But before a downpour, there is a flash of lightning. Similarly, there has to be a divine revelation. The golden Radha and the cloud blue Krishna have to appear in the heart. Then the water gushes forth, sweet tears of longing for the Lord whom you once gave up. Hare Krishna. Sanina Sachinandan Maharaj Ki. Very, very beautiful. Um, and on the subject of crying, you can see I'm taking a lot of help here because I'm, I have such a hard heart, I can't cry for Krishna. So I have to take a lot of help on this subject. I want to show you one more video. Um, <clears throat> one great soul once said, we are not opening temples. Uh, we are opening crying houses. We are opening places where people can come to learn the art of how to cry for Krishna. So that great soul, uh, His Holiness Govinda Maharaj, uh, I think we have to hear directly from his mouth <laughs> what he has to say about crying for Krishna. So will the sound work? We hope the sound will work. Like that. He made them cry. And crying 
<laughs> so uh, <coughs> maybe here I'll open it up to uh, Maharaj Hari Parishad. I see questions. I don't know if I <laughs> would like to. We could take some questions, but first we'll ask Maharaj and Hari Parishad Prabhu to please uh, add their ear. Please also correct. This is a deep, very deep subject matter, and I may have made some mistake. So please also, if I have uh, said something which may not have been 100% accurate, please also. Uh, well, Hare Krishna, I'm uh, really uh, <coughs> impressed by the depth of your presentation and the various quotations and at the end this uh, amazing video It, it, uh, there are many, many thoughts, but here's just one very brief. I think it's very important to understand that there are different types of tears which we uh, cry. And most of the time, we conditioned souls cry because of something that did not go according to our expectations that maybe we had made a mistake, maybe a relationship became broken. My father cried when he lost uh, I mean millions of uh, euros uh, because he had wrongly invested them. Our crying is self-centered uh, um, most of the time. And, uh, 
soul sometimes cry, crying is is also self centered but it's the real self. And I believe really if we ever want to uh, come to this level of longing, of yearning for Krishna, so that Krishna will take us serious and give us the mercy to overcome our obstructions. If we ever wish to come to that, we, we have to start from that. I'm not the body, I'm, I'm the soul. It's unless we, we, we start there, our tears will be uh, falsely self falsely. We will cry for something that is a dream only. This is here for a few days and gone after a few more days. Uh, so, yes, a uh, uh, second thought is we come to this level really by hearing about Krishna. We quote Bhakti Nautaka and he gave the example of Rukmini. Rukmini in her uh, young age had listened to Narada Muni who regularly came to her father, to Bishwaka, uh, and gave uh, Kata, he spoke about Krishna. And Rukmini is a little, really tiny little girl, was there and listened to this. So when the time came to, uh, for her to get married, she, she remembered that I heard about this person, Krishna. And he's, I, I, I gave my heart to him. And then he wrote, she wrote her famous love letter. It's a very interesting in the Bhagavatam for devotees to study the letter, which the content of the letter which Rukmini wrote. And um, I think mean, she talks so sweetly. But one of her verses is, only when you are in illusion, you are attached to a husband who is a pile of bones and mucus and stool, and he really goes into it. You are not the body, you know. If you really remember, but it's so strong. It's a little really a very cultured princess, but she really cuts the illusion there. But so both working on overcoming. Uh, the attachment to the body, the wrong understanding of the body is necessary and we also need to have Atta priority. We need to hear about Krishna. Both is, is highly necessary. Um, what is it? Anatta priority? Anatta priority. We need to become free from these anattas and wrong attachments. But we also need to hear Krishna. That was the idea behind arranging the speakers for the Eastern Retreat. And we are very, very, very grateful to you, Keshe Maharaj, that you took the part of, uh, you know, uh, an art We need to fight against these high things which come. Uh, that was necessary. And then, then the shikarini could be enjoyed much more, you know. So the, both need to be there. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So Maharaj, I, I'd just like to say, you know, it was a very intense presentation. And uh, at the end of every presentation, some, some individuals in the audience, there is a tradition called as Anumodan. Anumodan means uh, you say something that you like, but I can't point out one thing that I like because it's, you know, the entire presentation uh, I like. I could, the only reciprocation I could try to give is this afternoon, you know, <laughs> I try to reciprocate with your thoughts because many of our thoughts will match we'll be speaking about Vidana. But there's one particular point which I, the shocking statement by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sri Sakur. Maybe you could, you yes. know, go back to that, where he says that uh, 
Vrindavan is for bogus people. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's a statement by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. So, we accept it. And at the same time, my mind, the first thought that came to my mind is, but Srila Rupa Goswami, in the Nectar of Instruction, in the 8th verse, he says, Tishtan Vrajay, Tadanuraga Kijana Anugami. Always residing in Vrajay, in association of those who are Anuragis, or you know, near and dear ones of Krishna. So, I would request from you that you, know, <laughs> you, you resolve <laughs> 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 well, look, I will try to resolve, but yeah, you you try. You <laughs> try. <laughs> Please, because if Sri Rupa Goswami says you have to stay in Vrindavan, right there in the eighth verse of Upanishad, and Sri Bhakti Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur says Vrindavan is a place for you know, only all of bogus people favor Vrindavan, so. <laughs> It puts us in a real difficult place. So, the, what I feel is, and I may be incorrect, that those who go to Sri Vrindavan with the spirit of enjoying the pastimes of Sri Radha and Krishna for self enjoyment, so that was what was being referred to in this particular statement. Mm. But those who stay in any Tirtha like Vrindavan, Mayapur, Jagannath Puri, but they wish to serve Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, like they wish to render service to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu through their bhajan. So actually they are staying in Kurukshetra. Because if we see Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur did not actually move to physical Kurukshetra at the end of his lifetime. He stayed in Jagannath Puri. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur also, you know, at the end of his lifetime, he was in, I think, Calcutta or... Uh, last is in Jagannath Puri and in Calcutta. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there, I feel they're speaking about Kurukshetra as a mental framework, mm -hmm. where service to Srimati Radharani is being rendered. Mm. And service to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is being rendered. Mm. But I would like to you know, hear your thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, I, I, I thank you for the wonderful explanation. This was beautiful. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, we find also shocking statements by Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami. He says, for example, anyone who does not believe in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I consider a demon. So then we begin to think, uh, really? <laughs> it's like the born again Hare Krishnas. <laughs> so is this literally true? Yesterday, I think someone asked the question about how we become, we transfer from being the well-like to the ocean. And one of the points you made was that the ocean is being filled from many and sometimes we are also even learning from those who are in other sampradayas. So when Kaviraj Goswami says that everyone who doesn't believe in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is a demon, the way I understand that is my pure philosophical speculation, is that more than this being a philosophical statement about a negative is a deeply spiritually ecstatic emotion about the positive thing. And that is only there to bring light to that. But we're taking this literally, I think it's not a literal philosophical statement being made here, but it's simply a juxtaposing which allows to bring attention to what is actually uh, one is having no other way to express their appreciation for that except to juxtapose it in this way to bring the brilliance of that thing to light and so I think certain um, 
Shastric uh, statements are to be considered uh, emotional outpourings of ecstasy and someone may say are you saying is philosophically untrue then are you saying the philosophical statement is wrong but I would say the ultimate truth dharmasya tatvam nihitam guhayam the ultimate dharma is hidden within the hearts of the devotees and therefore if there's a philo uh, an emotional outpouring that sometimes may even seem to be philosophically uh, not quite fitting we should understand it's still 100% true in the sense of the spiritual appreciation um, so this is what I can offer and you can correct me if I'm <laughs> <coughs> Thank you for uh, speaking. Uh, as I said, you know, yesterday also I said Saraswati Devi sometimes speaks. You, know, <laughs> you made a wonderful point that uh, it's not criticism, but it's glorification of uh, what Shri Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati actually wanted to glorify. Mm. Because before the retreat started, I was asked to give Bhagavatam first. And I, there was a negative statement made in the purport. And there is a principle in Shastra which says, Nahi ninda nindyam ninditum prayujyate apitu ta dhikritasya prasham saritum. That actually criticism in Shastra is not so that, not because the speaker of Shastra gets vicarious pleasure by criticizing somebody. It is for glorification of the opposite. Mm -hmm. So that is a that principle you kindly reminded me of once again. So although it seems like criticism but you know, what it is is a glorification of the mood of Sri Purusha. Thank you so much Mahara. Really great. Thank you so Thanks. much. Hare Krishna. So um, I did see some hands, but I, I think there is a there is a question and answer session uh, later on, and oh, because some, some. we should okay, really, <laughs> Maharaj wants to put me on the, <laughs> these topics to give answers. Okay, okay, on Maharaj's order, we have to. Okay, so then, uh, Godruma Prabhu. Um, you you uh, <coughs> narrating your. meditation of crying like a baby. Um, is this, do you think this is um, a very good idea to come to this stage of, of really crying for Krishna? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever in this world helps you to cry. Anukulyasya sankalpa pratikulyasya varjanam. If it's favorable for devotional service and it helps you, but remember, it cannot be crocodile tears, as His Holiness Govinda Maharaj said. So, yeah, on that plane I was praying, may the samsarika cry of the baby become the sadaka cry of this lowly jiva that may one day by mercy become the siddha cry in the spiritual world. So I was praying and uh, thinking deeply about that, that yes, maybe that Egypt air flight became a crying school, a les lesson in the air. Um, life will make us cry. That's the way the world is built. Dukalayam Shashvatam destructive enlightenment they call it sound dangerous <laughs> <laughs> this world is destructive enlightenment because what Krishna does by the waves of time is he begins to take everything away he begins to take everything temporary away why? because he wants to cause us pain? no because he wants to reveal what is ultimately eternal so then Krishna begins to start stripping everything away and it's, uh, it's difficult sometimes. Srila Prabhupada was in Vrindavan and he wrote this beautiful prayer uh, poem 
वृंदावन भजन And he said, uh, "Today, uh, everyone has left me. Krishna has taken everything away from me. Yasya hamun grena mi harishe tadhanam shene tato dhanam tyajanta sya swajana dukadu kitam." When Krishna shows his special mercy, he begins taking everything away. Shri Prabhupada sitting there in Vrindavan, he says, Where are my mother and father? Where are all my family members? Where are all those people who loved me? All that is left of my family life is a long list of names. And then he said, Today Krishna has shown me the naked form of material nature, and it has all become tasteless by his mercy. And then Prabhupada said, This is misery. And then he says, but it gives me a laugh. <laughs> I sit alone here in Vrindavan and I laugh. Whom do I love in this Maya Samsara? Such a deep meditation, Srila Prabhupada. So, the world makes us cry. But it should be those criers, the Atma Krandan. You have to cry of the soul as Sachin Andamaraj writes in his there's a verse like that no? Bhakti Yoga Bhakti Yoga Bhakti Yoga Dhan Bhakti Ye Krishna Namir Smarana Krandan you want the Bhakti Yoga Dhan you want the wealth of Bhakti then you have to take Nam uh, Smarana Krandan and crying in your heart remember and recite Nam so yes I think life is like that we will cry but if somehow or other we can redirect those tears in longing for Krishna away from just frustration of the material world to longing for Krishna the tears that are arrested in the heart as Maharaj writes we redirect all of those emotions um, yeah sorry I just kind of went a bit around If anyone else would like to make any last comment, oh, okay. Yes, Prabhu at the back. In the Mahabharata, it's mentioned that the Padavas they went to the heavenly planets as destination. Uh, on the other hand, there are your <laughs> Vaishnavas. Arjuna is a friend of Krishna, and I heard that. Destination became that they became trees in Vrindavan. So, is there any uh, conclusion for us Vaishnavas and description? What was the destination of the Vaishnavas after their lifetime? Mm -hmm. I'll offer an answer based on what I've heard from the devotees and then I can be corrected. Uh, I had this conversation with Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. Uh, so he, he was giving me a perspective so I'll share with you what he shared with me he was mentioning that we have two accounts of the Pandavas and what happened after after as, as they left this world one account is given in the Bhagavatam we read in the first canto the Pandavas retire timely and then we hear of their journey and then we hear the account given in the Mahabharata of what happened and it seems there is slight uh, variation or different emphasis of course in Shastra sometimes we find different accounts because it can be Kalpa Bed, it can be talking about different time frames, different things happen but he was also making the point that Mahabharat is a Shastra which is a Dharma Shastra so it's uh, aimed for a particular purpose and one of the main purposes of the Mahabharata is to show that Dharma is incredibly complex. That to follow Dharma in this world and get everything perfectly right is incredibly complex. And show the Mahabharata wants to show that even the Pandavas, who were the emblems of Dharma, even they got implicated and had to have some kind of uh, vision of hell and other things as they left the world. 
and then it talks about them going to the heavenly planets and so on and so forth. But the Bhagavatam, which is purely a Bhakti Shastra, Dharma, Proja, the Gate of Otra, Paramo, is throwing away all of that. And then it actually reveals the true uh, situation, which is that the Pandavas were pure devotees. They attained a purely spiritual destination. So he was making the point that um, we may find a, a, a difference in narrative because of the different purposes of the Shastra and what they are trying to highlight. A story can be said in different ways. This is what I've heard and I refer to my learned seniors for further clarification and correction. If Yes, this answer has been given about Kalpa I remember once in one of the books of His Holiness Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Swami Maharaj, he was asked the same question that the Pandavas are described in Mahabharata <coughs> ascend to the heavenly planets, but in the Bhagavatam it's like they just liberated. So he replied by saying that the Mahabharata describes the external journey of the Pandavas. Hmm. And uh, Bhagavatam describes the internal journey. And well, I read that, but I'm not a person to be so easily convinced by this. <laughs> <just some knowledge. laughs> it has to make some some sense. So then uh, I was meditating upon what he said later. Um, somehow, by Krishna's mercy, I happened to read about a certain concept in Shastra that liberation is of two types. One is called Brahma Mukti, gradual liberation, where a person goes from planet to planet to planet to planet mm. and then gets liberated, like it happened with Gopakumar. Mm. And second is Sadhya Mukti, immediate liberation, where a person doesn't stop anywhere. Mm. So the Pandavas did, it seems Pandavas did um, experience Krama Mukti, staying on heavenly planets for some time before they achieve the spiritual world. But the Bhagavatam just directly says they achieve the spiritual world without describing the Krama or the sequence in which they achieve the spiritual world. So Sri Jiva Goswami gives an explanation for this uh, in that uh, uh, he says Baddha Parikara Stena Mokshaya Gamanam Prati Sri Jiva Goswami says like just like a person if you know if they want to travel a long distance let's say i have to go to delhi but walking and i just went out of the room i'm just right there on the road i just started walking somebody came and asked you know, where is hari parshad das you know he's he's not to delhi mm. he's not gone to delhi he's just right here outside mm. but people will say he went to delhi mm. so similarly sometimes shastra say that they went back home back to god in fact, they are on the path. Just right <laughs> so this is this is how I resolve it for myself. I I don't know, you know, what you feel about oh, this. Wonderful. Yes. There are a few answers there, different perspectives. This is very good. Is that okay? Uh, we should finish that. Maybe, yes, maybe the last, the, last the last one, yeah. Hare Krishna. So yesterday in, uh, in the presentation of Hari Parashat Prabhu, the emphasis was on Swajai, on self-study, and to write our own commentaries of the Bhagavatam. So I, I'm, I like to reflect sometimes, but it's good to have some sort of Dhammagars in the room to check. <laughs> our organizations are bonafide, so we have a few in the room. So I was thinking about the topic of union and separation. Like we know sep to be separated in separation are the conditioned souls who are oblivious to the existence of the Lord, so they try to replace the enjoyment with Krishna with some material enjoyment. So that's for me the first category. And the second one is those who are united with the Lord in union. Those in Vaikuntha, they're always with the Lord and they are united in union. 
We hear about the concept of being united with the Lord in separation. By this mood of separation, we are united. And then I was thinking about the fourth category, and unfortunately, I feel so much in that category, but I want to check with the Sarup Dhammadars in the room to see if that's valid. Is to be separated from the Lord in union. Like, for example, when we chant the holy name, or when we read Bhagavatam, Krishna is so much there. He is there, but I'm not there. So, to, in order to, to understand the mood of separation, we first have to really have some experience of union. So, would you like to say a few things about that, or if it's correct the way of my thinking or contemplation? This was the two banks that Hari Parshapu was talking about, so I'll let him. No, no, please, please. Let, let it come please. from you, Maharaj. No. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let me just reframe your question, just, just repeat it so I understand it. You're saying the lowest is when we're separated without union, just the conditioned souls. And then there's union in Vaikuntha. And then there's Vrindavan, or you know, then there's separation, and union, in separation. union in separation. So we're separated, but there's a sense of union there. And then you're saying, is there something higher than that, which is not, not higher, but just higher. another category mm -hmm. in which you are together, but there's a sense of being separated? Um, to me, this. Uh, does, does this not sound like Prema Vaichitya to me? Closely. It's close. No, like I guess Prema Vaichitya is more the anticipation that in the future you will be separated. So it's not exactly what you're saying. What I'm saying is that Krishna is very much there. there. It's not different from the holy name. And I'm chanting the holy name, but my mind is somewhere else. So it's, it's like separation. It's like separation in union. You're together with the Lord, but... I'm not there. I'm not conscious of the presence of the Lord. So it's an unfortunate stage, I feel. Inattentive. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I think when we're talking about separation in this realm, we're talking about something which is transcendental based on transcendental emotion. But when there's separation because of, you know, the you know, the things that our Acharyas talk about, laziness, distraction, uh, or absorption in other things, and the sense of separation that comes from material uh, diversion. I don't think that comes in the realms of transcendental separation. That's just, uh, that's just the distance we create because of our own uh, anartas. So in this case, the, the separation is being created by anartas or the block. Um, whereas in the spiritual world, uh, the separation is being created by transcendental emotion. And I, I would say probably that's why we can't necessarily say that's a separation of that type of category. It's just a separation which comes from... Um, yeah, a feeling of being, uh, yeah, our own anartas. But I think that kind of separation and that kind of feeling of lonely lowliness um, can bring a humility and a desperation which can then bring us into transcendental emotion. This is what I could say. You, would you like to add something? Can we get the mic? There is a comment uh, of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur which appears in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, his comments, and there he distinguishes between the feelings of separations of a conditioned soul who has not yet seen Krishna or, or who may even uh, rather he chants or has darshan be completely somewhere else. Uh, 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 that is one thing. And then he uh, distinguishes, he says, the feelings of separations of these uh, eternal associates. 
and he, and he says those in the material realm they are really completely separated from Krishna when they uh, feel this separation. Oh, where are you? Where are you? They are really, they are really separate. But those in the spiritual realm, they actually, and, and this here we need to be very respectful. This needs to be experienced. It's for our terminology paradoxical, but those of the spiritual realm, the moment they think of Krishna, oh Krishna, where are you? They are together with Krishna because for them the thought of Krishna is the association with mm. Krishna. It is different. For us who have not yet um, been in this, we are really in it. And our, our craze, uh, we are like that, Hare right, Krishna. Since I hear we are rounding up yes. here, and it is perhaps good, I, let me just say one brief organization point before before Gurdhari speaks. This evening we wish or this afternoon we have this question and answer sessions where um, Keshava Maharaj, Hari Prasad, uh, Hari Pasha Prabhu and myself um, will sit there in front and um, try to give ans answers to good, good questions. Now the this such sessions or programs can be the most interesting programs, and, but they can also be the most boring programs. <laughs> and, and what makes the difference? It's your questions which make the difference. So uh, you need to please do a little homework. Uh, find out where was the subject that you would like to have further explanation and we can really uh, make this session into a, a sparkling session which will be unforgettable if we have some good subjects to focus on and uh, we, I mean each one of these devotees uh, Keshava Maharaj and Hari Pasha Maharaj they can speak on any subject but we, but we want to speak on your subjects where, where you are interested uh, which are of concern to you. So please take a moment time to to think what could be a question and either you you have them in the notebook and ask them directly or you might like to condense and summarize your question by writing them down on a piece of paper and I can see Gorahari, yep. if I'm not mistaken, yep. here we have this most beautiful <laughs> question and answer box uh, which waits for your questions. Uh, so please uh, uh, do invest some thinking into your question. Hare Krishna. Hey, just a few other small organizational... <laughs> I think Prabhu just thing. wanted to say a few, one word on this, few words on Eka Yeah, right. sure, sure, sorry. <laughs> I think one of the slides answered the question where Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur said that the only separation which a sadhaka can feel is Purvarak. So that slide basically answers the question that uh, you are asking because in the question there is, I feel there is a confusion of sadhaka and siddha. All the stages of separation that were mentioned were stages that Siddhas experience in their Siddha Deha. Mm -hmm. But the question that you asked was about separation that is experienced in Sadhak Deha. So that sort of, the only separation that can be experienced is Purvara. Mm -hmm. And what you are explaining is something else. As Maharaj said that it is distraction and ultimately it becomes one of the ten Aparadhas in the in chanting of the Holy Name. That's, that would be Thank you. So we will actually quite soon be able to experience some feeling of separation because the retreat will end and actually to have the chance to be in association with such a beautiful Vaishnavas, when that stops, one, one feels something is really missing inside. So thank you Maharaj for preparing us.
But today is still the last full day, and we try, back to immersion retreat, we try to immerse still a little bit deeper. Therefore, we will have one more session. Today is the marathon of Shravanam. So we will have like normal program. Ali Pasha Prabhu will serve us the last round of Shikarini. And His Holiness Satchinandana Swami in the evening will also uh, offer the last last kata. And we will have the question on the session in plus from 3.30 to 5 o'clock. Uh, in case some of you did not register yet, uh, Valentina Mataji uh, is doing that in front of the, the temple room. Uh, please do it this morning, now, right now, 10 o'clock. So then, then it's done and then everyone can be fully into the festival. In case you have boring calendars at home, we have actually very beautiful calendars of Madame Mohan. And as the time is passing, they will soon not have like much a, a reason to be just they are very very beautiful darshans we will put them on the table outside please take it, take them for free and you can distribute to friends and, and yeah. pizzeria will be again open this evening it was just so good yesterday we, we we thought we have to do it one more more evening and yeah i think i said everything Everything is done. We show a good breakfast and please be back at 11 o'clock for more shikarins. Shila Pahupa de Kijas, Holiness, Vayam Nagan, Keshavan Maharaj, Kijas.